in the old topography. Because the old roads here, they are following kind of uh, very old paths. They do follow the topography and so on. They do follow the traditions, the, the way people are, uh, like to live and so on. So all those are totally erased and now we have an open city. Okay. I will not go deep into what was a Mahalle, now what's the open city and so on. There's a lot of uh, say, uh, legal changes that are it. Another maybe a big uh, say, uh, devastation in the physical shape of Istanbul uh, has taken place in uh, the summer of 1957. The so-called Menders operations, character of this, and of this, or here, the uh, Ordu Caddesi, the Ordu Street. Just from this point, uh, I will show you a photography uh, taken into this narrow, uh, say, method. Because during the 1930s, they did under Lutfi Kurdar, uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Kurdar, they did some kind of opening of boulevards, but they did not really uh, insist much on it. But uh, after uh, the, uh, the war in the Menders periods, we will see. So just a photograph taken from this point shows you how the uh, trend appears in this. This is March 57, October 57, taking the photo from the very same point. Okay. Or let's say, uh, let's look, uh, have a look at Aksaray. So you can see this multiple domes here. That's the rest of the station stage area. Uh, the Vatan Boulevard appears, even they cut through the old walls of Constantinopolis. And I mean, this is, if you look at guidebooks, this is still the old town of Istanbul, but where it's old. So there's a total change of the scale of the city. Okay? There's nothing that. Okay. And indeed, similar changes have occurred in many European cities after the war. But these cities were bombed. So in Istanbul, uh, change is even more severe than the bombed cities of Europe, let's say Germany or Holland, let's say just take Rotterdam, for instance. Just the like Essen and so on, as good examples. So, uh, in Istanbul, even more severe changes occurred without the city being bombed, just by the, plan, uh, by the hand of the planners. Okay. I will show you now a very uh, crucial example. So, I, I could follow the, uh, the cross at Aksaray. So, with many visuals, this is uh, first published by Zeynep Chilik. This is the before 1860s changes, this is uh, still the natural organic uh, pattern around uh, outside. That after the fire in the 1960s, rebuilding the very same cross, you see the grid emerges. You can see the borders of the fire. This area didn't uh, burn, so they, they left it. But the area that has burned has got the new grid. And look here, this is uh, exactly what corresponds to this map, okay? The second map. So. Uh, corresponding to the environment is like this. And this uh, continues throughout the last part of the 19th century all the way until the, well, mid uh, 20th century. 1957 becomes this. Okay. Almost 80 years it remains on this scale. Becomes this. A roundabout. 1970s they start building the... Okay. Become this. So now, uh, this makes, of course, I mean, uh, the question uh, now uh, justified. If there's no resistance, if no one feels traumatized, or if no one, maybe if people are traumatized, but they did not really uh, put it in words, and uh, it was just, uh, well, modernization is such a big thing, and so people do obey, simply, and they are overwhelmed. The whole discourse of modernization overwhelms. And so, if there is no uh, resistance, no organized resistance as we have today uh, to a similar uh, changes in space, so there, there, there were no Palestinians here in that sense that felt uh, uh, that tried to uh, create a discourse against it. But uh, how should they look at uh, these uh, say, um, events in the past? But, in, but indeed, if you look exactly, a little bit more detailed, what has happened is the following. So all these operations of Menderes have taken place in the historical peninsula. So these are the, the, uh, the black lines are here, which uh, these are the approaches. And indeed, it is nothing but a uh, intervention in space that is done in favor of this 1950s uh, uh, group of people who were now, uh, well, uh, 
get, get, getting mobile in their imported American cars. So this is what kind of was totally uh, redone uh, in a car compatible manner. And indeed, in the historical peninsula, where the most severe interventions were, were uh, you had the lowest uh, ratio of ownership of cars. Okay? So there were no car owners here. So they, and the, their territory was nothing but uh, a passage, a transit area. So it was just, the, uh, just their territory was used. Uh, so in that sense, it is a similar, a very, very similar uh, situation uh, to what we witness in the very same years what was happening in Palestine. <coughs> okay. um, <coughs> the real change in Turkish built environment comes in, indeed uh, in a very uh, unexpe uh, unexpected way. Uh, 1965, uh, the cut milk which uh, it's a law that enables that you can own property in the air. That means until 1965, uh, all property was owned so or if you build a building, so it had just one owner. If he died, uh, his heirs will get percentages, abstract percentages, but they would not get the uh, flat number one, flat number two, flat number three. No, they would just get 33% if they had, there were three heirs. If there were seven heirs, one, if everyone would get one-seventh of it. So after 1965, it is possible that you can own a particular partition of a building. You can, get a, a, you can be entitled to a uh, piece of space in the air in the 26th floor if uh, you are able to build with uh, the floor high building. They didn't build them at that time. And this would create, under circumstances of a growing population and a very high ratio of migration to cities. So this is now a very realistic situation. It's a new reality of Turkey. Post-war uh, reality of Turkey is the migration to cities, population growth, and everywhere we will see that this 19th century building stock will disappear. So between 1965 and 75, within 10 years, like a felt 95% of the total built building stock of Turkey, not only in Istanbul, that has remained from the 19th century, has disappeared. Until those years, you may say, you would have a different, let's say, type of regional architecture in Malatya, another one in Trabzon. It was different in Mula, different in Edirne, Another one in Mardin, and another one in Ankara, in Istanbul, and Bursa. Each city had its own regional architecture. If you go today, after the law of 1965, uh, so you will have from Hakkar to Edirne, from uh, Karas to Mula, you will have the, exactly the same uh, building stock. Okay? And that has erased, well, not only the 19th century or earlier buildings, but it has indeed erased an entire, let's say, um, memory in space of a multi-ethnic, multicultural society. Well, did the law intend this? Question mark. Okay. Of course not. One may say it was just a necessity of the society. We were growing. We needed more space. We needed fastly uh, more uh, space to live in. We had to uh, create uh, that new space as uh, inexpensive as possible. And indeed, this law which has created a new uh, strata of the Mitahit, uh, the new uh, petit developer. It uh, has enabled them uh, to create a new uh, say, uh, space, uh, to produce a new space, a uh, dwelling space, for millions of people who put into the cities. But at the same time, as a side effect, without really noticing it, it has erased, indeed, so after that, so in 1960, we have with the coup d'etat, we have this policy of erasing toponyms. With this law, we have the, well, just everybody. It's, it's now the mass participation. Everybody has a small house and goes to Mithaid and sells it and, well, and stuff like that. So this is now the, uh, what comes out. So this was the end of the second section. Okay, any questions so far? Uh, well, let's get all the questions in the end. And yeah, okay. so just maybe something comes up. So. so here I get to a story, my own research, which I uh, would designate very particularly as a uh, case of spatial site. Uh, for this, I will just highlight first uh, the way 
Istanbul center was structured in 19th century. Istanbul, in 19th century, Istanbul was a globalizing uh, city. <coughs> and the center uh, in that period uh, got fragmented. So the, the, the ancient center was just around Sultan Ahmed uh, at the end of the peninsula. So indeed, it did not change much since the ancient Greek city, the Roman Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. It was all at the tip of the peninsula. <coughs> In the Sultan Ahmed top of the area, uh, there was a center. But now in 19th century, we see that there is a fragmentation of functions, essential functions in the city. Okay. Um, the bureaucracy develops after Tanzimat, the Reformation period in, uh, from 1830s onwards. Uh, as a result, there is there's a need for more space, uh, need for office space for, uh, for the ministries. The ministries as such do develop. There is no uh, governmental quarter like you would find later in Ankara. Uh, but within that very dense urban space, uh, uh, they would build in, uh, say, uh, governmental buildings. So, uh, so kind of an administration quarter does uh, develop between Beyazid, Sultan Ahmed, uh, uh, Baba Ali, and Sirkeji in that area. Uh, a governmental district kind of develops. A central business district is, uh, well, on both sides of the Delta Bridge, and Delta Bridge is the continuation of the Bankalar Street, the Sirkeji area, so the, this is the, the global hub where you have <coughs> the financial sector, uh, insurance sector, shipping, etc. and this place there, all the way up to uh, the Delta Tunnel is also part of that. Um, now, uh, what's more important is, alongside the Bosphorus, a new area uh, develops. It is commonly known by the term Sahil Saraylar, the palaces on the coast, the coastal palaces. I think this uh, popular designation for this area is a too weak uh, term. Uh, it's not just palaces. Indeed, they are not uh, mainly residential. They have a much more important ideological function. I will call this the ideological representation. So this, uh, I'm going to uh, deal with the uh, content with it. Um, but uh, the first time uh, for the modernization, a built environment is created. Okay? And that is indeed the beginning of our Taksim story. This will explain us why we had the Gizim, mm -hmm. Occupy Gizim movement uh, uh, two years ago. There is a uh, fourth, uh, say, center, which is the representation uh, of the capital. So if you can invest into your real estate, you will seek a particular line, which is the access to the ground route, which is the main road on the ridge, and its side uh, ridges. So it is all the way from uh, Tunnel to Taksim to Shishli, uh, one branch to Machka, the other branch to Kutluz, Patavlada, and then. So this is where, say, where the major uh, say, um, uh, investment in real estate is done. So. Uh, and maybe we can start, uh, also say, uh, as the uh, Sultan leaves the palace, so parts of the uh, former Topkapi of the Palace, the Archaeological Museum, Chindu Fresh and so on, become, uh, say, uh, essentially uh, the musealization of the former Imperial District begins. So that, that may also be added to this uh, centrality. But Topkapi of the Palace itself is not any more central. It's a rather peripheral space from Delon. There is a dwelling space of, uh, of, uh, of the family of the uh, uh, dead sultan. So this is kind of the, the new fragmented geography, uh, central geography of Istanbul in the 19th century. So what happens now with the center in the early years of the, uh, of the republic? Uh, the central business is it shrinks. Simply, Istanbul is not anymore an uh, important, uh, say, uh, uh, commercial port uh, with uh, the Soviet Revolution, uh, particularly uh, the plastic trade uh, comes to an end. Like 20% ex expat population in Istanbul leaves the city. Istanbul is quite a marginalized city, not so uh, important anymore in terms of economic activity. It's just a shrinking, uh, shrinking port in those years. But I thought a new centrality emerges. So in the area of the uh, former ideological representation, just on top of area, a new center emerges. And I'm going to do well with it. This is the Machka Valley with Taksim. A new city forum emerges. So I'll just 
uh, this was not a very uh, brief introduction to it, and from now on I'm going to tell the story of how it happened. Just uh, the, the, the space I was talking about, the uh, ministries of the 19th century, Delta Bridge was the center of the CBD, uh, the financial district of Lanton Street, Grand Rue de Caratule is Isikla Street as the uh, uh, space for the representation of capital. So now the state axis. What do I mean with the representation of the ideological? So this is all the way, uh, that axis that starts in Topan and goes all the way through uh, Ortega, like seven kilometers a mile. And there are, uh, so, uh, these two palaces, Yildiz, for instance. Uh, there are at three spots in Yildiz, Dolnobach, and Topane, there are these clock towers and the squares. Okay. They are important there, and, and each of these uh, squares is also uh, a portico uh, of a, uh, let's say, monarchic building, a mosque, and these uh, spaces are used in a particular This is now the Dolnobach uh, square. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, this is uh, yet uh, the Topane. Uh, square, you see the, um, uh, the clock tower, uh, the barracks building surrounding it. Okay. <coughs> Dolmabache uh, is the main palace, and the square attached to it uh, will gain the uh, the role of a main square for Istanbul for like 90 years, from 1850s to 1940, when it was finally demolished and ceased to exist. What do I mean by that? So we have to see uh, this entire axis, but particularly the, the core element of it, the central part of it, the Domo uh, I would best describe it with the term Kulia, mm -hmm. a complex. It's an urban complex. It's, an, it's, an, uh, it's a matter of urban design. It starts here with the, the small harbor, and uh, the harbor facilities here of the palace. The mosque, which is not anymore the center of the whole Kulia, which is one element within the uh, uh, within the Kulia. Behind it we have here the Palace Theatre and in my view the most important two elements of the Kulia are here. Behind here we have a gas factory which produces city gas and here we have uh, the, uh, the stables, the Stable Armere, the Imperial Stables they're called and just to the right of it we have the Tomovacha Palace. Uh, here is the square, in the center of the square we have the, um, the clock tower which is indeed a secularization of time because you don't have to go anymore into the um, mosque to see what time is it exactly, but uh, the, uh, the clock is put into public space here, just passing by you can see the time. So it's now a new modern society that goes with time, it's there, so it's recognized the time in all these public spaces. There is a new uh, element of urban design, which is the alley, which is still uh, there, this uh, nice uh, alley with the trees, that links Dolmabahce with Beşiktaş. And behind uh, the palace on the north side, we have Akaretler development, which is quite uh, obviously a, uh, has taken as an example, the Regent Street in London. It, it is the exemplary uh, dwelling space. It is a residential unit for the elites uh, of, the, uh, say, uh, of the empire. So we have indeed here. But particularly, uh, so why do we have now the horse uh, so much, let's say, uh, stinky there? And just behind it, we have, if, just look at the, uh, the gas factory again, very much polluting. But if you look at it, on the other hand, so uh, uh, what do we use the gas for? We use it for lighting the streets. That means you can use now the public uh, space, the streets, 24 hours. Okay? Uh, and now you can use the streets with your chariots. Because it was uh, formerly called just a pedestrian uh, city. So these are indeed the achievements of the modern. The Bobacha Palace itself is not a very inhabitable place. It is more like a showroom. Uh, you may see it in a way very similar to, you know, today all middle class families go every Sunday, they uh, get on a car and they go to, uh, they go shopping in real estate. They go to all these, uh, visiting all these uh, new uh, condominiums, gated communities, whatever, all these new projects, and they are shown the, the exemplary flats in the sh they are shown the showrooms. We can understand the Dolmabaca Palace's Selamnik, uh, the man's space, indeed as a showroom of this uh, kind. This is where the elites of the empire do learn how to be modern, how to sit on chairs, sit on tables, eat with knives and forks, and so on. So the, the new modern uh, way of life is indeed collectively exercised 
in the global watch accounts in, in all this uh, Even if you uh, look now at some pictures, for instance, here, the, uh, Araba, uh, the, uh, the coach, the chariot, is indeed the uh, main vehicle to show that you're modern. It does not only transport you from A to B. You obviously have been coming to this old Omovash Square and you were just doing your rounds in, in the roundabout in front of uh, Square just to show that you are a modern one, that you are part of this new society. You don't necessarily uh, need to go to the, from A to B. You just show off. Just uh, There's indeed a word for it, piazza, because it's come from the Italian word piazza, which is the marketplace. So you market yourself, you show off. You, you, so uh, you market yourself with your chariots. It's very important that you are now a modern. So it's in the modernization, it's a, quite a top-down process that starts with the elites. Okay? So this is the area where indeed the new modern elites do show off and do kind of network uh, in that space. It's a place of ideological representation. So this is the, indeed the, uh, let's say the function of all that state access from Topania to Lulbis. Um, indeed, I have shown you this other question. Uh, I, I want to go back to this. Um, no, uh, this is a um, the Selamluk uh, on, on a uh, Friday prayer. Friday noon time. Now all the elites, the uh, all the Milazim and the generals and so on, all the military bureaucratic uh, etc. Elites of the uh, empire do go to Friday prayers. Just look here. You see here uh, many ladies. This could be a, a, a picture from Victorian London, or just go to Berlin, for instance, uh, at the Kaiser Wilhelm Gedächtniskirche. This is the Memorial Church of Kaiser Wilhelm. At the very same time, you will find very similar pictures where you will see all these elites of the uh, new German Empire networking on Sunday for the prayer. So this is not anymore the uh, say the congregation at uh, mosque, the Friday mosque where all different social strata come together in order to exercise the social solidarity. No, it is indeed a show of, again, of the, uh, of the elites. Okay. <clears throat> so because they do uh, live an exemplary life, uh, how to be modern. So this is the space for that. It is the whole context. Uh, it is, so it is the built context, what they have on this axis. Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> but now, what happens? from 1930s onwards. But look, uh, the theater is gone. So now uh, the, uh, the square has not anymore its physical shape. The stables are still there, but they will uh, go very soon as well. It's not from another perspective of the theater was gone. So uh, indeed, I, I'm just missing one uh, picture. Because for a short period, they have, uh, after they uh, pulled down the, uh, the stable, they made a park here, but they very soon uh, asked, um, uh, Paolo Viotti, um, Italian architect, to build a, uh, say, say, stadium here. And, Now, when we come to 1960, we see there's no square anymore. The whole area has become is converted into nothing but a uh, transit area for cars. It has become circulation surface.